You had more questions, we have more answers. Join us on the McCann Dogs podcast today. All right, so my first question, and thank you for sending in questions. If uh, you want us to answer your questions, send them to us and we will do our best to get to as many as we can. So this question says, I understand that distractions are bad during training, but what about socialization and getting them used to people and sounds? And you know what? This is a question that we get a lot because it gets really confused for people out right. there in society. So my tactics for socialization are in place because I want to make sure that my dog is well exposed mm -hmm. to the wide world mm -hmm. and neutral to the wild world. Right. I do not want to create a dog that goes out there and goes, there's another dog. Oh, it's the best thing ever. Right. Or that sees, oh, there's another person. Best thing ever. You know, yep. I, or there's a truck. I'd better chase it. Exactly. Because you know what? My life is pretty busy when it comes to the things that my dogs ex are exposed mm -hmm. to on a daily mm -hmm. basis. So coming to McCann's every day, having all sorts of dogs around all the time, all sorts of people around, I literally would never get anywhere <laughs> if, mm -hmm. if my dog thought every single thing in person or dog in person was their play toy and the most exciting thing in the world. My dog would be in a constant state of overstimulation. Mm -hmm. I would never get anywhere. It wouldn't be healthy for either of us. Right. What good socialization actually is. People misunderstand socialization. Mm -hmm. And we've actually done a full podcast right. episode yes. on socialization that mm -hmm. I think would be really enlightening for right. anybody who's like, huh, what are they talking about? Yes. I thought and socialization just meant I let my dog it, play with other dogs. Right, and it's it's... It's it's named wrong. It shouldn't be called yes. socialization. It should be called like exposure. Exposure. Exposurization. Yeah. I think that it used <laughs> to be a much more reasonable thing as socialization, right. but our society has changed so much right. when it comes to the dogs and we put so much emphasis on dog to dog play now mm -hmm. and dogs either being friendly or not friendly, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there's got to be room for the dog to be able to exist without being put upon constantly mm -hmm. by any person or dog. And as so with a young puppy, you might have a dog that likes and appreciates other dogs in their space all the time. You might have a dog that stays that way for the entirety of their life. You know, if you've got a, got a good old lab, for example, mm -hmm. labs are usually pretty easy yeah, going with so many things. Yes. They can be strong and powerful. So sometimes that, um, that makes them a little bit more challenging for mm -hmm. training, but they're usually pretty bomb proof when it comes to being social. And when it comes to, you know, not showing aggression out there. So th you might have a dog that through the whole entirety of their life is just really even in terms of temperament or really loves to play with other mm -hmm. dogs, etc. But the overwhelming majority of dogs as they get older, right. they get selective. Yes. So even well socialized dogs who have no issues whatsoever mm -hmm. and no sort of genetic temperament flaws that might predispose them to aggression, um even those dogs mm -hmm. We want to make sure that we're providing them with the opportunity to have that selectiveness. So right. I don't want to ever ex have my dog expect that every single dog is going to be in their space. Mm. That is, that's not how we do things at right. all. And that creates a neurotic dog mm. too, right? A lot of the times we create our own reactivity issues and we create our own sort of, you know, uh, aggression issues even mm -hmm. sometimes with other dogs. Sometimes it's more of a genetic component than anything, mm -hmm. but a lot of the times it's because we put our dogs into positions that we think they're going to appreciate and they truly don't appreciate. Exactly, yes. So, yes. Yeah. And it's kind of back to that too. Young dogs love to play with each other in mm -hmm. general, yep. you know, as, but as, yeah, it's, so it's let's, like, let's, let's talk about that for a right. second. Yeah, so I think of it like, like myself. Mm -hmm. When I was a little kid, I liked playing with other kids and running about and having fun. Yeah. But now that I'm, now that I'm in my twenties, <laughs> no, I'm in my fifties. <laughs> even That's a crowd, baby. even a crowded grocery store bugs me now. Like I'll, I'll go into the grocery store and you know, there's people around me and they're coming too close and, and it's, it, you know, the, it, everyone's in my way. And I find myself getting more aggravated with that. You need better socialization. So I'm going to take you to all the grocery stores when they're the busiest. The, right. And I'm going to like, I'm going to wheel you around in the cart and I'm going <laughs> to make everybody interact with you. Right. Yeah. Right. And like, and that's how our dogs get yeah. too. It's like, you know, when you're young, you're more gregarious and yeah. things bounce off you. But as our dogs get older, they're like us. It's like, I don't want to be at the grocery store Saturday morning at 11 a.m. with 
all the chaos. Yeah. I want to wander around the grocery store at you know, 2 a.m. in the morning when there's no one there. So <laughs> think of it like that. Like yes. your your eight-year-old dog doesn't want to get pounced on no. by eight-month-old Labradors. Yeah, exactly. So socialization in and of itself being exposure, that means your dog doesn't actually have to interact with those other dogs to get good things from being exposed to them, mm-hmm. which that's where I go for when I go for my socialization is, you know, my dog's in class with me, for example, mm-hmm. and there are six other puppies in that class. But the class is about my dog engaging with me. The class is about us working together. And sometimes that's a struggle because Mm -hmm. the other puppies are distracting. We do do a play session with our Puppy Essentials class because we think it's important to have a little bit of play in there. But it is such a small percentage of the program. Yes. And it's it's not just a free-for-all. We we get the puppies to pay attention to us first. We give them permission to play. And then we end the play by us taking control in a positive fashion. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say that that small play session is about exactly what you just said. It's about setting up a play session for success so that we can reinforce our mm-hmm. skills. It's about letting the puppies have a little bit of play in a mm-hmm. safe setting, right? right. We know and that- we match up puppies too. Yes, exactly. I, I'm not going to put a rough and tumble bull mastiff with a tiny little scared Sheltie yeah. because that's just- that's just terrifying little Absolutely. Sheltie. So I'm going to choose and pick and play. These are the puppies that are good. These are the puppies that will be good together. Yeah, absolutely. And there's not there's nothing really wrong with any play styles, right? Like it, it's just different for different mm. breeds. So your lab, as an example, is going to be a wrestler and a crash and banger. And, you know, mm. they're going to be body slamming and chasing down and rolling and tumbling with one another. If you have a Sheltie that's playing with that lab, the Sheltie's probably going, I hate this. I hate this. This is awful. Right. I'm fighting for my life. Yeah, exactly. So in terms of that being a good situation for the dog to just have have this opportunity to play with anyone and everything, Mm -hmm. it can backfire twice as easily as it can work to your advantage. And I would say- And it's it's showing too, the the Sheltie's having a bad time. And the Labrador yeah. is ignoring the Sheltie's body language. Yeah. And so, getting pumped up right, yes. by this situation and it, getting it, rewarded. It sees the Sheltie is afraid, but it's like, oh, who cares? Let's yeah. pounce, pounce, pounce. And it's it's a no win for both dogs. It's true. And, you know, as dogs, that reinforcement value for the lab is going to make that lab continue to want to bully because that was a rewarding thing for the dog to begin with. Right. So uh, we don't want to set our dogs up no, for that situation no. at And all. the poor Sheltie's saying like is my owner truly have my back is my owner a leader because right now they just my own they threw me to the wolves yeah Yeah. for sure and that same situation that lab playing with another lab who likes to crash and bang Mm -hmm. is equally you know all you have to do in that scenario is assess okay is this getting over the top are Mm -hmm. these two dogs mutually enjoying each other is this getting over the top do i need to interrupt do i need to stop etc based on that mutual play versus oh now i need to go in and wrangle this lab because the sheltie is going to be traumatized for life and Mm -hmm. you know this this whole scenario just is not great to work out and as a side note too if you're using a daycare be sure that the daycare employees understand dog behavior and can see these things happening because yeah. I see dogs go to daycares that should you know it, it's it's a worse nightmare for them yeah absolutely absolutely I I couldn't have said it better myself it's definitely something that can be very trying for a lot of dogs and I would say that play session in our puppy essentials class is not really about socialization no it's that, not that play session is about letting the dogs have a little bit of fun and a little bit of a rip seeing what kind of play styles they have matching them with the right play style so they can have mutually beneficial play and working on some skills like call outs from that play as well i would say the socialization actually happens all the rest of the time you know, when your dog is, your puppy is working with you and focused on mm-hmm. you and learning to do that despite those other puppies in the room. So right. they're learning to be indifferent mm-hmm. about those puppies when there's this opportunity to engage with you. And that is a well-socialized dog. You know, a dog that can walk down the street and be neutral when they see another dog or neutral when they see another human mm-hmm. is a well-socialized dog. Or neutral to noise too. Yeah. Or to have a normal reaction, like a, suddenly a jackhammer starts up. The dog's yeah. of course going to look, but the dog doesn't hightail yeah. it and try to run out. No, they might even, they might look, they might even startle. Right. But they yeah, recover. It, they, the recovery happens yes. quickly. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I, that just reminded me of a funny story. I was in the, 
I, I can't remember if I already told this story about the chicken coop. Um, there's an no. old dilapidated chicken coop on my property that just needs a match. With it needs old to come dilapidated down. chickens in it. It needs to come down. <laughs> and my nephew was down on the weekend and I walked into the chicken coop with him and I was just looking at something and there was a cat in the coop. A cat? That jumped out because oh. my property has tons of feral cats. Right. So all of a sudden this cat jumped out and I have a very big startle reflex. So of course I yelled and I usually end up yelling something like, <laughs> ah! like not like a scream, but like, I think I, I think I yelled out hey! <laughs> and my nephew turned, he's 10. My nephew turned and he ran as fast as he could out of the chicken coop. And then of course, right after I did my, ah! I, re- <laughs> I realized <laughs> that it was a cat and I recovered well. I've right. been well socialized. Got, right. I recovered quickly. But your nephew but didn't my stay nephew to was save out. you. No, he did not stay to save me and he was out of there so fast <laughs> and when I started laughing of course he stopped running at that point because right. he realized okay we're not in danger uh, anymore but he said to me like he said to me like what in the world was that and I was like that startle you there he's like yeah I was running for my life <laughs> <laughs> I said it was a cat it was a wayward cat anyway, uh, you should so start funny. a cat farm because you already have I have a lot of cats you have on my the property. cat starter kit yeah. already you know what I'm I need to get better at the startle reflex because there's a lot of cats popping out on my property from a lot of different places <laughs> that I don't expect I never expect to see right. them <laughs> like, right Ned usually knows they're there before I do but he wasn't with me when I was uh wandering around with my nephew hmm. anyway all right Let's do another Okay, question. I'm going to grab one. <laughs> okay. Oh, it's a cat one. Oh my That's gosh. Funny. Yes. Perfect. Perfect intro to that. Cat distraction with a cat that is confrontational to our biggest distraction problem. I can crate them temporarily for training, but not all day. Oh dear. That's a mouthful. Right. That is. Now, I've never had a cat, <laughs> so I've never had to work with cat distractions. Yeah. However, I have had uh, rats and guinea pigs and hamsters and birds with my dogs. Yeah. And it's something you just have to, you have to face and, and train through. Yeah, um, absolutely. You're, you're absolutely right. You, you can create them, but it's, that's not going to fix the problem. So we, we definitely need to have a house line on our dogs and we need to address the problem and yeah. work with the dog. With anything, I would say it's so important that we talk about the McCann method and how we do things with any of these challenges. We don't just bring home our puppy and let them loose and let them make choices that are going to be poor choices. You know, if I have a cat in the house, I need to teach my puppy how to ignore that cat. I need to teach my puppy that chasing that cat is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I want to do, if I want to be successful in teaching my puppy, those things is let him have the opportunity to chase. Right. Because every time that happens, chasing the cat, gets more exciting. So it just bumps that Mm -hmm. notch up one more point every time Mm -hmm. until you get to the point where the dog is so overstimulated just at the sight of the cat that it's going to take a lot of work on your part to bring them back down. So with the McCann method, our goal is always to get in front of problems before they become problems. Mm -hmm. So that would mean bringing the puppy in and keeping control while you build skills and communication so that you can then at that point say, no, you're not allowed to chase the cat and the puppy goes oh okay no problem Mm -hmm. but before the puppy understands any of our communication and any of our obedience skills expecting them to make that choice you know good luck to you they're they're going to make the wrong choice they're going to chase the cat Mm -hmm. that is what is natural for the dog to do and we can't override that without giving them other things to work on, giving them training lessons. Now, I think in there it said the cat is confrontational. Yeah, so, so in terms of the cat being confrontational, I have no advice. I have no advice. We're, we're, we're the dog end. <laughs> we're, we're the, the dog, dog end. end. Yes. Yeah. Now, I, 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 now, I've never had a cat, but you know what? If my cat is being confrontational, I might put my cat on a house line yeah. so I can control there my you cat. Go. You know, I, I, we tend to let cats just do their own thing, but yeah. I think I would, I would, ask, I would yeah, I would ask, why is my cat yeah. being confrontational? Like, what's, what is the, like, is the cat a danger to my puppy? Yeah, I've actually had, um, had a few cats in my life. My mother was the epitome of the crazy cat lady. So she, <laughs> we got raised on cats and then we moved to dogs. But I actually wrote an article about um, cats and dogs together mm-hmm. and how you can make that relationship very harmonious. Um, and in it, I talked about, 
the idea that the cat will often determine what kind of work you need to do. And it took me back, it, it, the article basically goes into a story of my sister bringing home this little white alley cat that um, his name was Roger and she loved that cat. He was very like, he was a very prancy, delicate cat, but he didn't take any crap from anybody. And he didn't go out of his way to be like confrontational mm-hmm. or, or not so nice cat, but he would stand his ground. So at that point she had two cats in our house. And this was when we were still living in my parents' house together. So many years ago. And Quincy was a young dog. I would say, I can't remember. She was probably like eight-ish months or something. So still in the learning process. And of course I was too. So she came along a little bit slower than my other dogs in terms of training. So she was probably, um, she was probably still a a big work in progress at eight months old Mm -hmm. at that point. But so my sister had brought home this new cat, Roger, and she already had this other cat, Billy, who Billy was incredibly skittish and never, never came out of the bedroom, basically, especially when Quincy was out and about. So Billy was the cat that would run from Quincy, and of course, Quincy would want to chase, mm-hmm. whereas Roger was the cat where, this is the funny part of the right, story. yeah. So Quincy at one point decided that she was going to hot tail pursuit with Billy up the stairs, and I don't remember what the scenario was with Quincy. I just remember the scenario with the cat, so I don't know if my sister was watching Quincy or if I was just dropping the ball in terms of controlling Quincy at that point. It's entirely possible I was young in my training, but basically Quincy started tearing up the stairs after Billy, and Billy, of course, immediately took off and ran, whereas Roger jumped from the top stair where he was sitting as Billy was passing him to the second stair and did that big cat thing, oh, right? right? With their back up. And went, yep. you will not chase Billy, basically. That was Roger's message as this delicate little white cat. And Quincy, who was, what, 70-pound Rottweiler, right. tough dog. But when she got that message from the cat, and here's, here's a good a good point about leadership, right? A good mm-hmm. point about you don't mess with the leader. So... This was Roger's right. reaction and Quincy went, oh, and immediately stopped and turned and walked back down the stairs. Mm. Was like, yeah, no, I'm not messing with that thing because that thing just like right. came at yeah. me and said no. Yeah. So, I mean, if the cat is reasonable in that confrontation, then I would probably right. appreciate yeah, that Yeah, that's lesson, fine right? for the cat. And, yes. And, and I'm going to back up the cat. Right. So if in that moment, if that moment was now, because <laughs> right. I don't know yeah. if hindsight, if I would have understood this or not, but if that moment was now and I saw Roger do that, I would be getting after Quincy too. No, you leave that alone. Right. You knock that off. You do not bug that cat. Right. And then I help add weight to Roger's mm-hmm. statement saying, you do not get to chase that cat. Right. Even though he was just a sweet little cat himself, but- he was right. bold yeah. and he, he was said the leader. No. Yeah. Whereas Billy, Billy would have turned tail and run any time right. Quincy was close. So there was never a message that said, you will not chase me. It was, it was actually an invite the to invite. chase yes. from Quincy's perspective. Yes. Yeah. No. So, yes. Yeah. So that's exactly. If your yeah. cat is, if your cat is being confrontational in a non-harmful manner like yeah. that, or even a cat that gives a swat at a dog, you know what? There's consequences in yeah, life. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Well, and I think sometimes it's about whether the cat can actually get away to someplace right. safe. And if they can, I'm sure that most cats would choose that right. instead of choosing to yes. actually take on the dog. I like Roger. But yeah, I like Roger, Roger. Is a good cat. I've often <laughs> thought that when I've watched a dog chase a squirrel, I've often thought, what would the dog do if the squirrel just stopped? <laughs> And just came at the dog. Rolled up its sleeves and went, all right, right. you know what? I've had it with you chasing yeah. me. Because I, I have some dogs that maybe would have taken on the squirrel, but I think a few of my dogs would have went, oh, okay, you're in charge, sorry. Because oh my, my yeah. pet rats, when the dogs sometimes would, I left the the pet rats' uh, cage open quite often. I had a huge, big, elevated sort of cage for them. And so they could come out of the cage and walk on the roof and they, they, they couldn't go anywhere. They would just walk on the cage. And sometimes the dogs would come and stick their face like, and in, in they had a little hammock or a little rolled up wrap they slept in. Okay. And the rats always bit the dogs on the nose oh, when I they bet. did that. Yeah. And the um, Honda learned immediately, never stick your nose in the, you know, after one little nip. Yeah. Cowboy took a few nips to finally Aww, get it. And she had a few cowboy. times little, little, I'd see a little dot of blood on her nose. And I'd say, hey, you had your face in the rat cage. But she, they learned that to respect those rats. And I was able to have the rats run around on the floor mm-hmm. in the living room and the dogs be loose and the dogs gave way to the rats. Yeah. The rats were definitely in charge. Yeah. You know what? 
animals are pretty smart. Mm -hmm. And if they think that there's a threat that might end up causing them harm, like instinctually, Mm -hmm. it's important that they not get in fights because fights could lead to damage and death. Like there's there's an instinct there for the dog to Mm -hmm. avoid confrontation in most situations. So if there's clear information that this is not acceptable then right. they're going to take that clear information. Exactly. But of course, most of the time, that stuff falls on us. Mm-hmm. And as humans, we need to make sure that we think through this scenario before we just let our puppy start chasing the cat. Right. So that's mm. the best advice. If you um, have problems with the cat beyond that sort of advice that we've just talked about, you definitely need to see a cat specialist because mm-hmm. that's not our specialty. Right, yes. But yeah, the they're, dog, a whole different, they're a whole different animal, yes. Yeah. It, it, a lot of the times, it's more about if the dog will, mind their P's and Q's, the cat will watch them disdainfully from across the room, Mm -hmm. but not advance. (laughs) (laughs) That's a cat for you, right? Okay, I'm reaching into the bucket again. Thanks for that question. Bucket O questions. Bucket O questions. All right, if you have to travel long distances after picking up your new puppy, do you crate them? How do you crate train when you have to use it right away? This is a great question. Mm -hmm. I have um, have a a lot of experience actually with picking up a puppy and then having to do the should I crate, should I not crate? And dance then, and, in my head and you had to create right away too because you went on yeah. an airplane yeah i did the airplane with ned reggie came from mm-hmm. virginia beach which was a 10 hour drive so we had uh we had lots of time in the crate mm-hmm. for that actually reggie did great in that scenario it was quite amazing that he slept most of the ride home and it wasn't until i was so grateful for this because i was so anxious about crossing the mm-hmm. border just something about that there's something about cross, yeah it's so anxiety producing it I, I was so worried that I was going to get, like, I had waited all this time. I had, you know, I had so much emotionally invested in this puppy, and I was on the last leg for bringing him home, and for some reason it was in my head that something bad's going to happen at the border. They're going to confiscate gonna be able him. To come home with him and something awful. I'm like, what? What possibly could be? And, like, I had all my paperwork in order. order. I wasn't trying to, like, mark down his price or anything like that to save duty. Like, I would not do that because it would make me more anxious. Than right. Me. Yes. It wouldn't be worth and it. And they, they're pros at body language. Exactly. They would. Yeah. And I'm sure my body language is already just like being in that scenario. They're like, oh, she's guilty of something. Look right. how nervous look, she looks. Yes. Really. I'm just a rule follower. And I've just got so much emotionally invested in this puppy mm-hmm. that I don't want anything to go wrong. And I'm so worried. But yeah, everything worked out great. He got across the border. And then mm-hmm. at that point he was like, okay, I'm done with this crate thing. And he started squawking. And Mm -hmm. at that point, my sister was driving. So Mm -hmm. I scooped him out of the crate. We snuggled the rest of the way. So I, um, I've, been lucky that I've had good breeders that note that there's going to be a long drive. We're going to help tire this puppy out. Right. And then with, with Reggie, I actually did it in two trips. So we did the first leg, Mm -hmm. stayed overnight in a hotel and then did the second leg the next day. So it wasn't quite as long of a drive in the crate because that, I mean, a long drive like that, it's a lot for a puppy. And especially a puppy who's not used to a crate. Right. So the last thing I want to do. And who's not, uh, used to holding their bowels and yeah. bladder either they're you know young puppies in the litter just stop and go wherever they feel like yeah, it Yeah, exactly exactly so yeah I always make sure that I have a second driver when I'm picking yep. up a puppy if I can I have a second driver mm-hmm. and that gives me the opportunity to nurture the puppy right. so if um if they're sleeping and relaxed, I'm of course going to leave them in mm-hmm. the crate and make sure that the crate is nice and safe. If they wake up, I'm going to assess. You know, maybe I put my fingers through the bars of the crate mm-hmm. and I say, hey, you're okay. Don't worry. Go mm-hmm. back to sleep. And I see if the puppy will go back to sleep. And maybe I actually open the door and let them out and have a little snuggle to take the pressure off a little bit. I, I do want my dogs to ride safely in the car mm-hmm. on a day-to-day basis. But sometimes you have to make exceptions right. to those rules. And this is a good time to make mm-hmm. that exception is assuming that you have a second driver. I would, yes. I would put up with the screaming if I was solo. Yes. I've driven home with a solo puppy. Uh, well, I've driven solo with a solo <laughs> puppy. <laughs> and yeah, I put the puppy in the crate and just listen to them scream. Yeah. Or I've driven home with a puppy when Ty was young and same thing, you know, you know, Ty's in the back with the holding his ears. And yeah. the puppy's oh. just a screaming, but that's what you have to do. Yes. Do not resist the urge to feel bad and let them wander around the car. That's oh, going to be yeah, a recipe don't do for that. disaster, even if they just fall off the seat. Yeah. A we, I had one of my Malinois almost jumped out the window as a puppy. Oh my gosh. So I don't know why we went to get a puppy without a crate. Oh, 
I think I had visions the puppy was, the Malinois puppy was going to sit in my lap. This is, of course, back in my 20s. <laughs> and I thought the puppy would just sit. This ride. was your first Malinois puppy, no, wasn't actually, it? No, this was my second oh. Malinois. <laughs> First Malinois puppy, we got young at seven weeks. So, you know, she was very like, yikes. But we got Saber. I think she was maybe 18 weeks. So she was already like this feral wild beast. (laughs) And I think I put her on my lap and, you know, she's already a fair size. And right off the bat, she did this sprung and and went went to the back. We had a Mustang with the uh, hatchback Mustang. And it was hot with no air conditioning. And the windows were down. And she's in the back chewing on one of Dan's baseball gloves. I remember that. (laughs) Really? Leather. Leather, yep. And because it's a hatch, it's a two door. So we got the windows down. And all of a sudden, she made this leap for the window. And I remember grabbing her by the waist, like... And it was, it good was catch. not good. It no. was not good. And th- I, back in my 20s, yeah, I did some. 20-year-old Christine sounds hilarious. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> so but, fun. yeah, but, you know, and I, you know, I, I learned, you know, I learned my lesson from yeah. that. I think, oh my gosh, Christine, like, what was I thinking? Like, yeah. you know, that was 30 something years ago, but you know, still <laughs> like, oh my gosh, Christine, like, you know, it's, you know, Saber turned out to be a well-adjusted, well-trained dog, but you know, that drive home was, <laughs> I remember we had a yellow hatchback Mustang. Training starts tomorrow. <laughs> right. We'll, yeah. We'll start training yeah. tomorrow. Today she can be a free. She buddy. was far more, she was bigger and what had happened was our first Malma flyer had died of leukemia at a young age. That's awful. And uh, the breeder had said, you know, come on up. I'm going to replace her because that, you know, she was only two. She shouldn't have passed away so young. So we were very unprepared, I think, going up gotcha. and still well, in a state and of shock. probably foggy from the grief. Yeah. Right, yes. I can, I can appreciate that. Right. That and it would be easy to make mistakes. And I hadn't, I don't think I had realized how old this litter of puppies was and how feral they were. Um, <sighs> This, yeah, this breeder was, he was, he was a bit different. He was a bit okay. different. And uh, the dogs were only outdoors. They were, uh, I remember uh, Saber came home and she had so much dirt in her ears from being in this outdoor run that oh. we had to get her ears irrigated at the vet. Oh my goodness. And I, it was like, it was enough to plant an entire rose garden in there. <laughs> so much dirt. The roses, the roses grew out of her ears. Right, that yes. That sounds kind of nice. Right, yes. Oh my goodness. That's but yeah, funny. yeah, but so yeah, yeah that was a crazy That was a crazy ride home. Don't do that. No, crates are definitely a benefit and they'll keep the puppy contained and keep the puppy safe. You know, sometimes we need to make that little bit of an exception with our young puppies. If we do let them out of the crate in the car so that they're not upset if we have a long drive home. But I want to make sure that everybody is very aware that you, even with a baby puppy who knows nothing about the crate yet, get a moment of silence before you let them out. Mm -hmm. Okay. So whatever that means, this is where our interruption techniques come in so handy. So if, for example, my puppy was in the crate screaming in the car and I thought, okay, you know what? I'm going to bring this puppy out for a little break and a little rest from this crate. What might you do to get a moment of silence before opening the door? I might, uh, rattle my car keys or tap on something and that little bit of noise will the puppy will stop and go oh what's that and then there's my moment to get that dog yes yes and let them out so yeah yeah, often a noise startles them and they're they're quiet for a few moments yeah and it seems like a little thing but it is immense Mm -hmm. because we don't want our puppies to learn or be in be reinforced Mm -hmm. for making noise we don't want them to think that that gets them out of the crate right So if I did need to make that adjustment, I would do something like you just suggested, a little bit of an interruption technique, and then when you have that quiet moment, you can let them out of the crate at that point. Right, yes. Same thing with my rats. They used to grab the bars of their crate with their their teeth and shake themselves on it, and that means they want it out. And we did let them out. But it created rats that every time we walked past, they would grab the bars of their their, their little crate and shake it and shake it. And, they're so um, smart. They're just smart like dogs. Yeah. So animal training is animal training, I've decided. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's true in mm-hmm. a lot of cases. I think it's your turn okay. to reach into the magical question box. Oh, let's see. That's why you oh, have this your librarian qu- look today. This question's upside down. I do have my librarian look. <laughs> I don't know why they gave us an upside down question. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. What if you live in an environment where you can't escape distractions? What do I do? Ooh, that's a tough question. That's a tough scenario. Right. Huh. Well, there, 
<laughs> I think they're meaning maybe, like, say I lived in New York City. Yeah, exactly. And as soon as I walk out the door of my apartment, it's, you know, I'm in New York City. Yeah. Um, you, you definitely need to do work then yeah. in your home where it's quiet. So I'm going to do all the basics where it's quiet. Then I'm going to maybe try in the lobby or in the hall. Then I'm going to notice on the sidewalk where there's low distractions. Mm -hmm. So maybe at uh, nine o'clock at night, it really quiets down. Yeah. Or maybe if I get up at five in the morning. So I'm going to, I'm going to give myself a little few inconveniences so I can get out to practice at times when it is quiet. Yeah. Or maybe I'm going to, if I have a car, I'm going to get in the car and I'm going to take my car to a quiet park or a quiet forest or a quiet neighborhood. Yes. I might, um, you know, it's like, okay, like right now I live in downtown Hamilton. And if I had a brand new puppy, I could see myself driving up to my parents' neighborhood to practice. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to go out of my way for the benefit of the puppy. Yeah. And I think like sometimes there are scenarios where you just really don't have that choice. And there are situations where, you know, say in that same situation, for example, we're in New York City, it's a busy, busy place, and I need to toilet train my puppy. Mm -hmm. And I don't have a yard of my own because right. I don't think many yards exist no, in New I York City. I don't think City. so. I bet, I bet they're very few and far right. between. I don't have a yard of my own. I've got to get out there on the street with this puppy and find a place for them to go to the bathroom. So... I'm going to minimize the damage as much as possible, mm -hmm. which for me with a young puppy would mean I'm carrying them for the first yes. little while so that they don't rehearse pulling. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's not going to be a solution forever, but in the interim, I'm starting to teach skills. And for those outings where I really need to get my puppy out to go to the bathroom, I might carry them. But I'm not just going to take that path when I need to get my puppy out to go to the bathroom because that will leave me in a situation where all my puppy has learned is how to be carried through mm -hmm. that scenario. Yes. So I'm going to carry my puppy when I need to get out to go to the bathroom, but then I'm going to set up that training situation so that I can work on some skills mm -hmm. in that you know, in that pathway. So in the hallway, in the lobby, getting to the outside to get to the bathroom area, when my puppy doesn't actually have to go pee, I'm going to work some skills at that point. So he has an opportunity to learn what he should be doing right. in that scenario. And then I can mitigate the damage a little bit. So as my puppy's knowledge is increasing and I'm preventing the rehearsal of the behaviors I don't want, eventually this is going to balance out and create a scenario where my puppy will listen with those distractions. Right. I'm also going to, too, I'm going to let people know that my puppy's in training. Please ignore yes. him. So I'm going to, and it's hard socially sometimes because we, we want to placate people and please mm -hmm. people. But you know, if my puppy's in training, I'm going to, you know, the person that's coming over to pat him, I'm going to say, you know what, me, you know, maybe in a few weeks you can pat him, but yeah. if you can hold off now, right now I'm in training and the best help you can give me is to ignore him. Yes. Because if, yeah. if every person comes up and pets my puppy, now my puppy has that expectation. And now my puppy's coming down and he's looking. Where's the people coming to pat me? Where yeah. are they? And it's it hard is to not get the focus. Pe puppy petting parade. No, <laughs> no. So advocate for your puppy yeah. and don't allow human distractions or other dog distractions to interfere. Yeah, absolutely. And this is where too, you're going to have to persist with your training efforts. And at some point there's going to have to be that messy piece where you're mm -hmm. working on things because this is the environment that you have. This is the environment that you have to get your puppy used to. You're working on things that will be challenging in that environment. But a lot of the times people go into that without having a plan, without having tactics, without having the training behavior behind it. So of course the dog just ends up rehearsing the pulling and rehearsing the wrong things. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I am working on leash respect and I have a solid idea in my head of what good leash respect looks like, what I need to do, I have my flow chart all mapped out in my, in my brain mm -hmm. where if this happens, then I'm going to do this else I'm going to do this. I'm going to reward at this point, you know, and I've practiced that in the quiet environment right. first of my apartment mm -hmm. and I've gotten my mechanics or starting to get fluid right, and yeah. my puppy starting to get a good understanding of what it is I'm looking for. And now I can take it out into the real world and it's going to be messy. No puppy is going to go from that white room to a busy environment right. and be able to be a rock star in it. That mm -hmm. is not realistic. We need to help them, but we need to persevere in that help. So it's going to be harder than it is in the white room. And I might have to reassess, you know, it's not quite ready for this yet. I need to work in the lobby mm -hmm. a little bit more again before I continue out here. 
but I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to, you know, throw my hands up in the air and go, oh, well, training doesn't work. I'll just let them pull. Mm. I'm going to work until I get past right. that messy middle piece and then triumph happens on the other side. Right. Yes. <laughs> because I've been to New York City and there's lots of very well-trained dogs yes, there. I absolutely. really, uh, I remember walking through Central Park quite a few times and marveling at how well behaved these dogs yeah. are. Yeah, because they get used to it, mm-hmm. right? I mean, you walk down Toronto, it's the same thing. If right. you walk down Toronto streets around yep. here, it's so busy. There's so many dogs. And you see them all ignoring each other, mm-hmm. ignoring all the people traffic. Again, there's a situation where people would never get anywhere if they were relying on letting the dog follow all their choices and oh. make the wrong choices right. and yes. want to visit Like every- they do in the suburbs, yeah. <laughs> Hey, I'm suburbia. <laughs> All right. That's have, a shorty. You got a shorty I, there. Uh, yeah, this one's a shorty, but it's right side up. Oh, which you're is lucky. good. Yeah, I yeah. got the challenging one. Yeah. I wonder if they'll give us one in a different language <laughs> one day. This is actually this is an interesting question. Um, which dogs make the best companions for the elderly? I love this question, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're elderly, so we, we're in a good position. No. <laughs> Well, I am elderly. We're, we're young. I feel elderly inside some days. Oh, well, you don't know. Things elderly. are starting to hurt. Oh, like for no reason. Like the other day, my ankle started to hurt and there's oh. no reason for that. <laughs> other than I got out of bed. Oh my God. Well, that's a reason. Right. Yeah. That's it. I'm staying in bed from now on. Did you step on a Nyla bone? No, no, The last no. time my ankle hurt, I you traced it back to stepping on a, oh. a Nyla bone. No, I don't think kidding. I've stepped on anything. Have you ever gone Nyla bone surfing? Oh, I've kicked one. <laughs> I've walked in bare feet and kicked one. Oh. <laughs> if you have Nyla bones in your house, you know. And if you have smooth floors, ceramic tile, you know what this yeah. feels like. You can, we yeah. can start a support it's like group. It's like a Lego. Up and on the Ow. Lego. <laughs> Ow. Alrighty. So this, I like this question a lot. And right away, right away, this takes me to an emotional spot with my mom mm-hmm. and her little CKC oh, Spaniel. Right. Yes. And what's CKC stand for? Uh, Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. Mm-hmm. And truly, he was the best breed of dog for my mother. Um, he was small enough mm-hmm. that he was not going to physically out muscle her, even right. though he tried his darndest <laughs> because she loved him with right. every ounce of her being, but uh-huh. she did not want to, she did not train him well. <laughs> so she did try at times, but she just didn't, uh, she didn't ever get there. And you know what? That's the thing with a CKC Spaniel, right? She got away with that because they're lovely. They're not, you know, they, they want to be lap dogs. Mm-hmm. They, they, they were originally bred as, as flea collectors, right? right yeah. You know, they would sit on the lap of nobility uh-huh. and the fleas would end up on the dog. And of course they were bred to be that companion and want to be mm-hmm. snuggled and held and mm-hmm. hang out with the nobility right, and yes. the, the people with wealth that could afford a dog. Mm-hmm. So that worked perfectly right. for her. Right. And Breeds I'm, that are bred for companionship. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And there's lots of those. There's mm-hmm. lots of dogs that are not bred with this great work ethic and desire, and they're happy to hang out on the couch all day. So right. I would say get something that physically you can manage, mm-hmm. get something that energy wise mm-hmm. is reasonable for you. Right. So what like a you, little shit zoo. Yeah. It doesn't need a whole lot of exercise. So if exactly. it's if it's slippery in the winter and you're elderly and you're having trouble getting out, yeah. you know, you can throw the ball down your hallway to exercise the dog. Exactly. Absolutely. And like little games go a long way. Yeah. The little bichons, things like that. Dogs that do not require a lot right you know with any dog and any age and any person think about your activity level level and what makes sense to you right another thing though to think about when you're older is little dogs require bending yes and so if you're having trouble bending you know that's another thing to consider so you might even maybe find maybe go to a breeder and maybe yeah. there's an adult golden retriever. Maybe that's seven or eight years yeah. old. That's it's got some training. Trained, and-, and you're not going to have to do that little bit of bending yeah. or big bending to get to the dog. Or even like our, our retired racing greyhound. I was going to say that, very, but they're not, they don't have any more. They don't no, exist anymore. You have to get them it's from us. You can still get them from Australia. Okay. So one of my friends has recent, very recently in the last month uh, adopted one. And she went through an agency 
probably in Canada or the United States. Okay. And I guess they're still racing them maybe in Australia. Okay. Or I, I'm not yeah. sure, but she brought over two actually. The first one she adopted didn't get along with her other dogs, so it was rehomed. And then, then she's got a second one now that's working out perfect. So, uh, yeah, like a tall yeah. sight hound often. They, don't, they require less exercise than yeah. you think. And they're often quite sedate and they're tall. So, yeah. yeah, often a puppy might be too much for, like, it depends on how old. Like, often I know a puppy is too much for me. Right. Yeah. So, like, I know, like, you know, if you're 20, you're thinking Shannon and I are elderly, but, you know, we can still handle <laughs> puppies. But, you know, if you're Shannon and I's age, we're thinking like a 90 year old, you know, is elderly. So, it all depends on your, your mobility, too. Like, yeah. a puppy is often. A lot when you're old, you yes. know, sometimes getting that, you know, or maybe like a, a rough collie that's, you know, like seven or eight years old yeah. and is calm and nice and yeah, reach out to, to breeders of dogs that you like and see what they have. Sometimes they have dogs that they've run on. Sometimes right. they have dogs that are a little bit lower energy. Sometimes they have dogs that have been returned, mm-hmm. you yeah. know, and usually those dogs have had a reasonable start in most cases, or they'll have good information from the breeder themselves. So right. it'll be a nice way yes. to start if you're not necessarily wanting or able to right. start right from scratch. And a good breeder is going to say, let's try it on a trial basis. You know, take this dog and, you know, if in a couple of months it's not working out then I'll take the dog back no problem at all so if you're not sure look for a breeder who will take the dog back yeah don't commit to something where the breeders just you know oh yeah no it's yours now like same with a rescue dog too yeah and something else that might be worthwhile for you to think about is maybe doing some volunteering at a shelter versus right. having a dog in your own home. And, you know, I mean, obviously you'll have to work within your own capabilities, but a lot of the times there's dogs that would just enjoy somebody sitting with them mm-hmm. and spending the time, a right. little bit of social time, building confidence, yes. things like that. I so. think I saw a meme on Facebook where there was a man who went and just let cats sleep in his lap. So he Aww. went he went to the shelter and sat on a chair and just kind of snoozed himself and the cats would sleep on his lap. There you go. I thought, you know yeah. what? I wish that was a full-time job. Yeah, absolutely. I would do that. Cat napper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, maybe it's not a scenario where you necessarily want to have the responsibility of the whole dog, mm-hmm. but you can still... Yeah. Or foster. You know, yeah, foster is... Foster, a, yeah. As long as you're able to emotionally detach. <laughs> right. You don't end up with, they affectionately call foster fails. Yes. Yes. We have a few instructors who've done those, haven't yes. we? Yes. And I would be a foster fail a hundred times over. Yes. I definitely would have a hard time. Mm-hmm. Hard time. Yeah. But always think too, um, we sometimes in our classes, we'll get people, you know, in their seventies or eighties and they show up with like a St. Bernard. Yeah. And they said, well, I've always had St. Bernard's and you know, it's been, you know, 15 years since their last one. And, uh, you know, their health has declined, their strength has declined, their, you know, just, yeah, you don't want to have to deal with that. So exactly. you think about getting the breed, think about what the breed's going to be like as an adult, because um, often we forget what they're like as puppies. Yes. And puppies are a ton of work. Mm-hmm. Yes. I think it's your turn. <laughs> oh, I, oh, Hopefully you get a, oh, that oh, one's so tiny. I just picked the tiniest it question ever. It has one ever. word. What is, how many words is it? It's on four that? words. Oh. And it's got a lot of letter B's in it. So okay. I like the alliteration All already. Right. Best breed for beginners. Oh, we're getting these great I questions. I know, right. I have a feeling that they coordinated I, some of these yes, questions for I, us. And I think a lot of it is the same there. Like yeah. if, if you're a raw beginner, don't get a dog that is born and bred and dying to work yes. all the time. Yeah. Get, get one of Ease the compa- yourself into that. Yeah. Get a companion breed. Get, yeah. get a breed that's been, you know, bred to be a happy companion and doesn't have all these ulterior m- motives that they're living their life <laughs> in. Ulterior motives. Yes. Like. Yes. Yeah. I agree with that. Um, I, and I think for, if you don't have the, the strength and the power concerns, like your average lab, it's hard to go wrong right, with labs. Yes. You know, labs are our steady eddies. They're a reason that they've been the number one dog right. in, I mean, I don't know that they are currently, no, but I, think I know French that they French bulldogs, have been, believe it or not, are. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Yeah. I know that they have been the number one dog for at more years probably right. than any breed has. And there's a reason for that. Right. You know, we love our labs. They're right. so goofy. They're so happy. They're powerful. Mm-hmm. They're very, very strong from a very young age, but they generally are just joyful. Right, yes. And as puppies, I often call them a bull in a china shop as puppies. Yeah. 
But, you know, you work with them and, you know, most adult labs are nice dogs. Yeah. But watch your bloodlines too. If you get a, a field bloodline, a yeah. hunting bloodline, you're going to get a much higher dog. Oh, yeah. Than if you go to a you know someone who's only breeding for good confirmation and good temperament. Yeah, I would only get one of those types of dogs if I was working with it every day. That right. is not going to be a couch potato. It's not going to be a weekend warrior. Mm. But your average, you know, family bred lab is going to have boot spa and get up and go. Right. And they're going to be a little bit easier to manage in terms of that workability, but there's still going to be options for working. So if you did decide, oh, you know what? I kind of like field work or Mm. hunting and I might want to get into that, then you could still do that with that dog. You really, the the field bred dogs, unless you're hunting pretty much every day and bringing in tons of birds or unless you're field trialing, et cetera, those dogs are are really better suited to those types of homes. So um, so yeah, with goldens, I would say. There's quite a breed split in goldens. So Mm. be very aware if you're looking for a golden retriever. I would have, I'll tell you, I would have said golden retriever right up there with Labrador or retriever except that we're seeing so many possession issues right with young golden retrievers yes. these days so mm-hmm. um oh ho- another great breed for beginners miniature poodle yes i um, would totally mini- agree miniature poodle nice size yeah. super athletic super smart yeah. easy to train miniature poodle yeah you can get their hair cut in whatever shape you want <laughs> it cut they don't have to look like a poodle you can get them cut anyway yep. they come in tons of colors mm-hmm. they don't shed miniature poodle Miniature poodle for the Miniature win. Miniature poodle. Ooh. Okay. There's two, three. I don't know if that one's shorter or not. I don't know. This is a medium oh, there's, one. There, it's a medium one, but there's a lot. Oh, there's a lot there's of words. There's a lot on yeah. it. So I think that they were trying to trick us up, our yes. producers. So Okay. What about apartment dwellers? Not everybody lives in houses with lawns and gardens. And you guys equipped to only educate people with law. Lo- oh, are you guys equipped to only educate people with lawns and gardens? So um, we talk quite a bit about people in apartments. We get a lot of students in apartments. Yeah, yes. And apartments and condos are a really big part of life in this area of the world. Right. So, yeah. We live in a very congested yep. Southern Ontario and I, they're building constantly apartments now. Yeah. It's, I think it's more common than houses. Absolutely. Apartments, condos, that whole thing, the whole building structure um, is going up. Yeah. All those dogs still need training. So here's the thing. There's often this, um, there's often this miss, I call it a misconception that people in apartments shouldn't have dogs because dogs need, need room to stretch out and they should have yards, et cetera, et cetera. And I actually wrote an article years ago that um, I think was pretty well received, but I also took some, some, some flack for Mm -hmm. it. But I think it's really important to note that having a yard and a house does not make a dog's life better. A lot of the times it actually works in reverse of that because it's so easy to just throw them out in the Mm -hmm. backyard that training isn't as necessary. And then they lead this really small life where their life is basically house when you get home and then out in the yard for fun. Because eventually, you know, if you get a lab and you decide, "Eh, I'm not going to train it because I've got a yard, Mm -hmm. eventually going for a walk with that dog is going to be really, really difficult. So are you going to persevere and teach the dog skills at that point? Or are you going to go, ah, you know what? I'll just throw them out in the yard. I'm not Mm going to be bothered teaching them skills. Right. And that happens a lot with people who have the luxury of a yard. Guess what? In an apartment, you don't have that luxury. No, no. You need to get that dog out daily. You need to train that dog. Mm-hmm. You need to make sure that you can live with this dog in right. that apartment situation where they're not being a nuisance to your neighbors mm-hmm. by barking constantly. Right. They're not, you know, chewing up your your apartment and things in it, just like what would be in mm-hmm. a house. They know how to hold it going from the apartment building outside. Like all of these things require training. Right. And I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with living in an apartment as nope. long as you're aware right. that that makes things more difficult in owning a dog but necessary to right. train. Yes. And I, I would look for, if I was getting a dog in an apartment too, I'm going to look for breeds that are easier for apartment life too. You know, I wouldn't want to get a dog, a hyper alert barking dog. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm going to look for a dog that doesn't, you know, isn't known for barking. You know, yeah. uh, you know, all dogs bark and all dogs are going to bark in your, in your apartment building. But some breeds are more predisposed to genetic to bark. Yes. Yeah. If you have a new puppy that's coming home and you live in an apartment building, take a moment, go and knock on your neighbor's doors before that puppy comes home and say, listen, this is what's going to be happening over the next couple of days. I apologize in advance. Please know that we're not torturing an animal. Because mm-hmm. sometimes it sounds really alarming right, when a puppy yes. crying in a crate. Please know that and we're not torturing loud. an animal. Please know that we're working hard on 
bringing this issue mm-hmm. to a close and, you know, have a conversation with them so it doesn't become this point of, of pressure between you and your neighbor. Mm-hmm. And hopefully the, hopefully you have neighbors that are understanding and that you'll be able to return that favor when they do something that right. might encroach a little yes, bit. Yes, when their, their son space. gets a drum set. Yeah, there mm-hmm. you go. <laughs> There you go. We're doing a lot of drumming. Right, yes. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, puppies make a lot of noise in the crate. So keep that in mind. If you live in a duplex or an apartment, you know, your neighbors aren't going to be pleased because your yeah. puppy's going to be crying in the middle of the night. Yeah, exactly. You might uh, you might need to deliver bottles of wine to your immediate neighbors as a as a please don't hate me for the next couple of days gesture as you get things under control and help the dog get used to being. Yes. Crazy, so it, it, so. it requires a bit more planning, yep. getting a puppy in an apartment, yep. but it definitely can be done. And those puppies often are very well socialized. They've seen a lot. They have good training. And the person spends more time with them. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Because they got to get them out. Exactly. Yep. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad that we answered that question after we had already talked about some apartment stuff I know, earlier yeah. in the episode. Well, I think it's my turn. Is it it's your turn? It's my turn. <gasps> did, I, did I read that one about the apartment? Oh, I did, didn't I? Did. Oh, I got a, I got a big one. Oh, my Ooh. goodness. I maybe should I, need my glasses for uh-oh. this one. <laughs> we are planning on picking up our new puppy on a weekday night. Do you think it's better to pick up the pup on a Saturday morning instead to maximize the weekend time so we can train her free from any work or school distractions? I say yes. Yeah. I say yes. When I get a new brand new puppy, I always take a week off work. Yeah. Always, always, always. It's a good idea. Yes. You know what's really important to note in that too is that week should still look like what your week will look like when you go back to work. Yes. Because it can be a very big culture shock for the puppy if they get used to you being around all the time and then Mm -hmm. all of a sudden you're gone. Just because they've settled into the new home doesn't mean that that's going to fly well with them. Right. So in a perfect world, that week home really mimics what your regular life is going to look like. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that means... Lots of crate time when you're home right. and just just dealing with like that that week I would spend helping my dog get used to their new surroundings, helping mm-hmm. them learn how to deal with the crate, doing some early training, et cetera, et cetera. And consider that an eight hour period of time is a really long time for a puppy oh, to, to be alone. Yes. So and it's you, often longer than eight hours. Yeah. Cause, you know, travel. Yeah, travel. Sometimes people tack on the lunch and yeah. that's too long for a puppy. It is for sure. So you might need some help in the interim, mm-hmm. right? Hiring somebody to come in and yep. just let the puppy out in the yard for a pee and maybe a little bit of a playtime, mm-hmm. let them stretch their legs, have a little break. Right. You might have a neighbor that comes over or yeah. maybe a responsible teenager in the neighborhood who has yeah. given them a little part-time job. Yeah, mm. absolutely. And then what you're doing doing is is you're balancing that stuff out right Mm -hmm. so as the puppy is growing they're able to hold it longer they're going to be able to go longer without that interaction Mm -hmm. and they're also getting skills and whatnot while that's happening yes so so yeah if it's a wednesday night and you both got to be at work thursday morning yeah no i would not unless i could drop the puppy off at my parents or a friend's or take the puppy to work i yeah i wouldn't No. And here's the thing. When you bring home that puppy, you want to minimize stress on the puppy, of course, but you also want to minimize stress on yourself. Mm -hmm. So bringing the puppy home and then going back to work the next day and worrying about the puppy all day long while Mm -hmm. you're working, that's stressful. I wouldn't want to do that. No. So, I mean, luckily I I bring my new puppies to work with me, so I don't have to worry about taking time off. But, Mm -hmm. you know, at that, that is it's a stressful thing to have to think about leaving right. this leaving new the puppy, puppy yes. home alone. And even, you know, anything in that situation right. is really stressful. Yes. So yeah. yeah. And the poor puppy too, he's gone from being with, you know, six or seven other puppies yes. to now like absolutely nothing. Yeah. Absolutely. In, in a strange place. Yeah. Make it easier on both of you. Yes. For sure. Yeah. And yeah, you don't want to miss out on the cute, the cuteness of the first exactly. week. Exactly. They grow so quick. They're oh, only they they're do. only tiny for a short time. Only for a week. Yes. And then <laughs> for a mad. week. Then they're full adults. <laughs> <gasps> We're at the end of our question. Oh, and it's a long one. Oh, I see the word whining. Okay. My puppy keeps whining after every distraction I do. As soon as I go to say good girl, she starts whining again. So some dogs are naturally whiny. Oh, they are. And some dogs whine because they're agitated at that point. Some dogs whine because they're seeing things that are exciting. Mm-hmm. They're anticipating things. So I would say if my dog is whining at every distraction, then I probably have moved too quickly mm-hmm. into distractions. And sometimes that's necessary. Mm-hmm. You know, we have to live life while we're training our dogs. So 
My best advice in those scenarios, you know, if you have no choice but to go to the busy vet clinic waiting room, for example, mm-hmm. because you have to go in and get a puppy vaccination shot, mm-hmm. I'm going to minimize the damage as much as possible. So in that scenario, I might stay outside with my puppy if the if the lobby is busy. Mm-hmm. I might do a little bit of training mm-hmm. outside with the pup. And then if it's really cold and I'm done with training, I might pick the puppy up and walk into the vet clinic. So now I'm not having to battle with that neurotic puppy energy that's going, oh, look, a piece of candy, a piece mm. of candy. Uh, there's another puppy. That's exciting. What's that over there? There's fluff on the floor. You know, <laughs> I don't have to deal with all that chaos in the moment. And instead I can work on helping the puppy calm. I can Mm -hmm. feel him because he's in arms. I can do a little bit of collar and body hold where Mm -hmm. I kind of tuck him against my body. And if he's excited, he might struggle a little bit and I'm just going to tense up Mm -hmm. and wait until he settles. And then once he settles, I can relax again and I can tell him he's a good puppy. That's very good. And I can help him learn early emotional control. And then I'm going to be systematic Mm -hmm. about introducing distractions in any other setting so that I'm doing it where I keep the puppy engaged, listening, Mm -hmm. giving me the best possible attention that they can give me. And then from there, I'm moving on to a little bit of a stronger distraction that's not going to throw them over the edge in terms of getting them so excited that they're Mm -hmm. whining, but it's going to be enough that I'm continuing to build on my training. Right. So, Mm. yeah. That was a fun question. Yeah. That was a fun episode. I really like doing the Q&A yes. episodes. Yes, it's nice are. to have like so many different topics. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And some of them kind of overlap. Yeah. And uh, yeah. 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 It's like the variety box of chocolates. The, the variety box. Life is like a box of chocolates. You, you never, never know. know what you're going to get. Oh, that was good. <laughs> that was Jenny and me. We was like peas and carrots. I don't think <laughs> mine was nearly as good. I went a little bit too Wayne Newton. <laughs> Okay. All right. Let's next week podcast. Next week podcast. We're only doing our impressions. <laughs> next week's podcast is a dedication to Wayne Newton. We're doing Wayne Newton impressions all podcast long. <laughs> I'm instructor Shannon. Until next week, when I'll be instructor Wayne Newton. <laughs> I'm instructor Swatty. I'm jo- I was John Denver earlier today. <laughs> <laughs> Happy training, everybody. Bye bye. The McCann Dogs Podcast is brought to you by McCann Professional Dog Trainers. We help dog owners to have a well-behaved, four-legged family member. Please give us a call at 905-659-1888 or visit us at McCannDogs.com. Happy training!